landscapes that we inhabit. And um, as you already know, the series of talks and discussions so showcases new research and approaches to architecture and its histories. But the hope really is to create conversations that allow us to think expansively about wo both what art is and what architecture is. Um, we'll cover a range of different topics over the next five sessions. Um, some of you were here already for uh, last week's session on history designing architecture. And uh, we're looking at many different kinds of things over the next couple of weeks. So please look at the program, sign up, and come back. Um, I'm going to hand over to Rick uh, Woodstra to talk you through today's uh, event. Thanks. Um, so thank you, Sriya, for that introduction. Um, it is my pleasure uh, for our second event of the Architecture Summer Series to introduce Jatwit Chang. And I'm so grateful that he's made the trip all the way from Singapore um, to share some of his latest research with us tonight. So the subject of his talk, Thermal Governance and the Modulation of Heat as Temperatures Rise Due to the Climate Crisis, is of course a very topical issue. But it's also a subject which shows how wide-ranging and interdisciplinary architectural history is today. Tonight, we'll hear about cases from Singapore and Doha, two cities that heavily depended and depend on air conditioning, and hear more on the spatial connections of thermal exchanges across different scales, bodies, interiors, cities, and even planets. Dr. Chang is an associate professor of architecture at the National University of Singapore, and works, across, works at the crossroads of architecture, environment, and STS, or um, science and Technology Studies. In 2016, he published A Genealogy of Tropical Architecture, Colonial Networks, Nature and Technoscience, a fascinating account of the long histories of tropical architecture, and a study that has won several prizes, such as the International Planning History Society Book Prize, and it's also made a deep impact on me during my PhD, and now I often list it as required reading for my students. A more recent book with Justin Zhuang and Darren So is titled Everyday Modernism, Architecture and Society in Singapore and focuses on modernism and modernist heritage in Singapore through social histories of ordinary buildings, infrastructures and landscapes. Our lecture tonight will be followed by a brief response from Kim Furster, who is a lecturer at the University of Manchester and a visiting professor at the APFL in Lausanne. Previously, he worked as an Associate Director of Research at the CCA, or the Canadian Centre for Architecture in Montreal. One of the projects he led there was a multidisciplinary research project on architecture and for the environment, as part of the Andrew Mellon Foundation's Architecture, Urbanism and Humanities Initiative, which has recently resulted in a beautiful publication, Environmental Histories of Architecture, which our speaker tonight was also part of. Um, his research and teaching focus on environmental and material histories, and particularly on the global history of cement as a commodity. He's published also widely, but I would just like to briefly mention his contribution to Beyond Concrete in 2022, a book that questions strategies for post-fossil building culture. Now, if you would please join me in welcoming our speaker, Jiaqui Chang. Thank you, Rhys, for the very generous introduction. Um, thanks also to uh, Rhys and um, Shriya for organizing this um, lecture series and for having um, me in the, in the, for inviting me for this lecture series. Um, I also like to thank Kim um, for responding to this and also for everyone here for attending um, tonight's lecture. I know there are probably better things for you to do out there. So um, I'm thankful for the time that you're going to spend here. Um, this is a work that has been in long progress. Um, one or two of the audience members might have heard a previous iteration of this. Um, I hope today is a positive development from a previous iteration. Um, and um, because it's a work in progress, so there are um, things that are unresolved. Um, there are questions, there are gaps. Uh, so feel free to um, raise any questions um, or comments on this um, later. So with that, um, let me start. As temperature rises and heat waves become more frequent and intense due to the climate crisis, cooling technologies, particularly air conditioning, have received much attention from global environmental NGOs and international media. 
International Energy Agency 2018 report, The Future of Cooling, for instance, highlights the threat posed by the quote, rampant growth in demand for space cooling with far-reaching implications for emissions, energy security, and electricity costs, end quote, and caused the threat a looming coal crunch. It warns that if unchecked, the global energy demands of air conditioning were more than triple by 2050, which will strain energy infrastructure and exacerbate climate change. Most of this escalation in energy global demand in global energy demands rather for air conditioning will take place in the global south due to the convergence of climatic, economic, and demographic trends. In 2018, another report titled Chilling Prospects, Providing Sustainable Cooling for All, was released by an NGO, Sustainable Energy for All. Taking a broad understanding of cooling, including both space cooling and coal supply chain, the CEO of Sustainable Energy for All, Richard Kite, said, quote, in a world facing continuously rising temperature, access to cooling is not a luxury. It's essential for everyday life, end quote. Given the importance of cooling, the report urges governments around the world to close the cooling excess gap for the estimated 1.1 billion population, mostly in the global south again, who are currently unserved or underserved by space cooling and coal supply chain for them to meet UN's sustainable development goals. From the two reports, the re key challenge seems to be how do we cool the world's population in an equitable manner without further warming the planet. In 2018, the Global Cooling Prize was launched to address this challenge through a technological fix. Organized by Rocky Mountain Institute and supported by the Indian government, the prize was a multi-stage competition with a total reward of $3 million US dollars in search of an affordable and radically efficient room air conditioner designed primarily for the hot climates of emerging economies. The Global Cooling Prize technocentric approach to a social environmental problem is typical of prevailing methods. In disaggregating and isolating the techno-scientific from the social, reducing cooling to a technical problem to be solved by engineers and technologies, the organizers of the prize have unwittingly followed what media studies scholar Nikos Staroselsky called thermal objectivity, subscribing to the belief that temperature is independent of culture and heat is only a subject of scientific study. Staroselsky contends that thermal objectivity masks the operation of thermal power, which is, quote, the enactment of social and political power through thermal manipulation that today constitute a pervasive means of biological, social, and environmental control, unquote. Thermal objectivity is closely bound up with thermal universalism in that the thermal is not only seen as being separate from society and culture, it's also understood as being without history and even independent from place. This lecture questions the underlying thermal objectivity and thermal universalism in the pervasive technical solutionism to the conundrum of equitable cooling in the midst of the climate crisis by exploring the techno-politics and social-technical histories of mechanical cooling in two cities in the global south, Singapore and Doha. Both are characterized by thermal heterogeneities that are in part typical of and in part exceptional for the Southeast Asian and Arabian Gulf regions they are in, making them, in my view, fascinating cases. As heat acts on body and affects their thermal regulatory mechanisms and metabolism, thus influencing the productivity, health, and well-being of populations, I argue that regulating the intensity and distribution of heat in the environment, particularly urban environment where population concentrate, has historically been a matter of biopolitical concern and was subjected to modern governmental intervention. Using the concept of thermal governance to describe such state intervention, this lecture foregrounds the roles and the underlying political rationales of the developmental state of Singapore and the oil rentier state of Qatar in the air conditioning of their urban built environment. It also emphasizes, and this is perhaps the part that is rather tenuously linked to the notion of British art, the influence of thermal imperialism on colonies and dependencies like Singapore and Doha during and after former colonialism. This talk is organized around two historical cases, one each in Singapore and Doha. Uh, so without further ado, let us start with the first case. 
In 1969, a mere four years after Singapore became independent, a proposal for the building of a district cooling system in the city centre was put forward by International Air Conditioning, or IAC, Singapore Private Limited, which was a distributor of carrier air conditioner in Singapore, Malaysia and the region. The proposal was closely studied by and received significant support from government agencies such as the Urban Renewal Department, or URD, Public Works Department and Public Utility Board. The Development Bank of Singapore, or DBS, which was established by the Singapore government in 1968 to finance Singapore's industrialization, was also involved in the proposal. Alan Cho, the head of the URD and the planner in charge of Singapore's urban renewal, was very keen on the proposal and encouraged the D DBS to take a leading role in the project. DBS subsequently agreed to finance 25% of the building of the district cooling system. DBS financing commitment provided a significant boost for the proposal as it was a capital intensive project designed to supply chill water as a public utility for the air conditioning of the surrounding buildings. A district cooling system is an infrastructure that consists of at least two main components, a central cooling plant that houses centrifugal chillers to provide chill water and a network of pipes to distribute the chill water from the plant to the surrounding buildings. As the compressive refrigeration technology behind the chiller was energy intensive, an enormous amount of electricity was needed to power them. The quantity was so large that the IAC proposal even included the possibility of generating its own electricity. The idea of selling chill water from a central plant for air conditioning was first proposed by Willis Carrier, the quote-unquote father of air conditioning in 1940. However, it was only implemented for the first time in Hufford in 1962. By 1970, there were still very few companies operating district cooling system in North America. And in the same year, a district cooling system was first built in Asia at the site of the Osaka Expo. Even then, the high-tech implementation of a network computer-controlled district cooling system in Osaka was regarded as a failure as it produced an uneven distribution of coolness. In other words, at the time that the Singapore proposal was put forward, district cooling was still a relatively new and unproven technology, especially outside the United States. Although the district cooling proposal by IAC was subsequently not implemented for reasons not stated in the archival documents, it was very seriously considered and close to being realized. Why was Singapore a newly independent nation with a modest economy at that time seemingly willing to invest in such a capital-intensive and untested idea of providing air conditioning as a public utility. Relatedly, why was air conditioning considered an essential utility in Singapore, or at, at least for a city centre, when it was still widely considered as a luxury in the developing world? To answer this question, one might start by looking more closely at one of the two schemes in the proposal, that for the downtown district. The scheme show the chill water pipes laid in three phases, as you see on the screen, expressed in different colours. The proposed distribution of the chill water pipe suggests that they were laid out to serve two types of development. The first consisted of old colonial government buildings at that time occupied or managed by the post-independent government. This included the City Hall, Supreme Court, Parliament House, Empress Place, Victoria Theatre, Fullerton Building, Hill Street Police Station, National Museum, the National Library, all concentrated around the Colonial Civic District. These colonial classicist buildings typically have lofty and well-ventilated interiors with high ceiling and large windows. These features were designed to ameliorate the hot and humid tropical climate of Singapore. However, air conditioning was installed and spaces were renovated with ceilings lowered and opening sill in many of these buildings from the 1950s to accommodate mechanical cooling. The second type of development that the circuits of the chill water pipes in the proposed district cooling system were designed to serve were the new buildings being planned for the plots of reclaimed land along Beach Road and Shenton Way. These were plots of land sold by the government under its sales of site program in 1968 and 1969. According to the planning guideline issued by the State Planning Agency, these developments will be, were to be modernist, high-rise podium tower blocks. They have deep floor plates that had to be mechanically cool and artificially lit, making them an air-conditioned typology. 
Although the podium tower block was a global typology first established in North America by a number of emblematic air-conditioned buildings, it acquired rather different social technical significance in the 1960s and 1970s context of Singapore. Conceived for Singapore in the early 1960s, as shown in the area perspective on the screen, the podium tower blocks were envisioned as a part of the modern, modern spatial order that would displace the old colonial shop house city. Shop houses are terrace houses originally planned with features like courtyards and louver windows to facilitate passive cooling by keeping the sun out and allowing air circulation. But since the early 20th century, shop houses have been deemed as overcrowded and insanitary slums ripe for demolition. Shop houses were porous not just environmentally but also spatially that blur the boundaries between the interior and the exterior. As the name shop house suggests, this was mixed use neighborhood combining commercial and residential spaces. The streets also took on multiple users as market, food center, and conduits for both pedestrian and vehicular traffic. Such users of indoor and outdoor spaces follow a pattern that was in tune with the diurnal and seasonal changes of environmental condition. During the mid 20th century, such spaces of rhythmic interminglings were deemed messy, inefficient, and insanitary and they were to be ordered, rationalized, and cleansed. In contrast, the podium tower blocks were much larger, hermetically sealed building that created interiorized environment that relied on air conditioning to create a thermal steady state across time and space to keep their inhabitants comfortable so as to allow uninterrupted and extended use of a space, unaffected by diurnal and seasonal changes. The boundaries with the exterior were also clearly demarcated and spaces were zoned for different functions for the purpose of order and efficiency. In short, podium tower blocks represented not just a modern visual and spatial order distinct from its other of the colonial shop house city. It also represented a new ambient environment of constant and consistent, chilled, dehumidified air made possible by air conditioning. In the post-independent state of Singapore, such atmospheric conditions were regarded as politically and economically important. The first Prime Minister of Singapore, Lee Kuan Yew, a Cambridge-educated Anglophone elite, famously said, I quote, air conditioning was the most important invention for us. Perhaps one of the signal invention of history, it changed the nature of civilization by making development possible in the tropics. One forgets this living in North America or Europe or Northern Asia. Without air conditioning, you can work well only in the cool early morning hours or at dusk. The first thing I did upon becoming Prime Minister was to install air conditioners in buildings where civil service worked. This was key to public efficiency." End quote. The air conditioning of colonial buildings occupied by the post-independent government and the embedding of air conditioning in the built environment through urban planning guidelines that prescribe the podium tower typology in Singapore city centre could therefore be attributed to the importance least government placed on air conditioning. All this eventually turned Singapore into an air-conditioned nation with chilled, dehumidified air enjoyed by its population as an ambient entitlement. But how do we understand the correlation that Lee and other colonial bourgeoisie, including members of his cabinet, make between environment, labor, productivity, and development? Why did Lee assume that the hot and humid climate of Singapore would diminish both physical and mental labor productivity and taught social economic development? And where did the belief that air conditioning was critical to overcoming the climatic barrier to efficient work and the attainment of civilization come from? I argue that they were shaped by two constellations of powerful ideas from the 19th and early 20th centuries. The first was the colonial environmental imaginary of the tropics as an uninhabitable torrid zone and social environmental other to the temperate norm that was not only excessively hot and dangerously unhealthy for the white man, but also uncivilized and backward as compared to Europe and North America. The rise and fall of the miasmatic theories of disease transmission and the emergence of tropical medicine in the 19th and 20th centuries contributed to the imaginary of the tropics as a negative authority. More than just a work of imagination, such imaginary has, in the words of Timothy Mitchell, quote, 
force and durability from the way it is reproduced and extended in rebuilt and reordered worlds, end quote. The second constellation of ideas could be traced to the birth of thermodynamics in the 19th century, the two laws of thermodynamics on the conservation of energy and the irreversible dissipation of energy or entropy combined to emphasize the importance of energy conservation. Socially, these two scientific laws gave rise to what political scientists Kara New Dajet called energy as a ruling idea, in which energy became a hegemonic unit of equivalence used to compare entities across time and space. It was most significantly used in the governance of work by evaluating, quantifying, and disciplining work according to the energy-infused matrix of efficiency and productivity. Under the logic of energy, the human body turned into a machine for energy con conversion and conservation. As energy is seen as permeating through everything, connections were also made between environmental and bodily energies, especially in work sites. Few of knowledge pertaining to the science of work, such as Taylorism, ergonomics, and industrial physiology, emerged from the 19th century to govern laboring bodies and non-human assemblages in workplaces across Europe, North America, and their colonies. One of the main preoccupations in the science of work was human fatigue as it affected production and output. Fatigue was sometimes also attributed to the work environments of factories where heat emitted and humidity caused by machines and industrial processes were not properly dissipated, creating hot and steamy atmosphere. Combining these two constellations of ideas of the colonial environmental imaginary of the tropics and the understanding of the thermal environments of work based on energetics, the tropical environment began to be seen as energy draining and even nerve wracking, causing mental pathologies like tropical neurasthenia and fatigue. For instance, Yale geographer Elso Huntington famously argued that the climatic conditions affected the global distribution of human energy, with hot climates leading to inertia and manifesting in the lack of industry and civilizational attainment in the tropics. Oops. Sorry about that, let me reopen the file. Alongside this environmentally determinist and racist view of the tropics, there was another view that could be characterized as environmentally possibilist and ameliorist. While sharing with the determinists the colonial environmental imaginary that saw the heat and humidity of the tropics as inhibiting socioeconomic development, the latter view believed that cooling technologies could overcome such environmental shortcomings that in part accounted for the colonial obsession with cooling technologies, especially air conditioning in the first half of the 20th century. A self-styled, ceaseless advocate for air conditioning in the British Empire was C.A. Middleton Smith, the Taiku Professor of Civil Engineering at the University of Hong Kong. Smith, whose view was widely published and reported, including in British Malaya that Singapore was a part of, was convinced that air conditioning would further the British civilizing mission in its tropical colonies. He wrote, I quote, only those who have worked in the tropics for years can have any knowledge of the enervating effect of excessive humidity in the atmosphere, and that the mental and physical efficiencies of humans under, under certain local climatic condition is about one half that of what is an ideal climate. It is obvious that when the climate is so depressing to vitality, ideal atmospheric conditions can be provided within a building. There will be a great stimulus to the economic development of the tropics because of the resulting increase in human efficiency. The empire has been made the trustee for such a large area of land within the tropics, for it is the duty of the British to accelerate its economic development for the benefit of humanity. Air cooling will be a great factor in carrying that duty." End quote. We would find Smith's view expressed in, 19, in a 1936 article rather familiar as the same assumptions about the effects of tropical climate on human productivity and conversely a similar faith in air conditioning's impact 
on development could also be found in Lee's earlier statement from 1999. Despite the 60-odd years that separate the two statements, it's clear that colonial ideas continue to be influential in post-independent Singapore. When air conditioning was initially introduced to colonial Singapore during the 1930s, its use was very limited. As an expensive technology to install and operate, only a small social economic elite in the colonial society could afford it. The cool, dry air of air conditioning was a thermal privilege that few enjoyed in colonial Singapore. Most of the colonized population still languished in overcrowded, insanitary, derelict, hot, and poorly ventilated structures. With decolonization and the emergence of Singapore first as a self-governing entity in 1959 and finally as a fully independent polity in 1965, thermal governance was significantly reconfigured. Unlike the colonial period, the prevalence of heat stress could no longer be accepted as an excuse for the underdevelopment of the tropics in the new era, when development was promoted globally by both governmental and non-governmental organizations. In addition to the will to develop, another impetus for climatic modification at that time was the taxi acceptance that freedom from heat stress and the associated fatigue, exhaustion and injury was a part of universal human rights. Sorry about that. Maybe it's too hot, too much heat. <laughs> In this context, the climatic possibilities and Amelary's theory of control and modification become even more influential. The proposition made by British politician Sidney, Mark, Sidney Frank Markham in 1947 that, quote, one of the basic reasons for the rise of a nation in modern time is its control over climatic conditions, end quote, resonated with many, including Prime Minister Lee, as we saw earlier, and informed the widespread implementation of climatic modifications through planning and design. In post-independent Singapore, climatic modifications for thermal governance took place in conjunction with its territorial revolution, which involved not just urban renewal and the building of podium tower blocks, but also the construction of infrastructure and mass housing that transformed the land, water and air of the city-state. Although not explicated, thermal comfort was central to the plan. Due to resource constraint, air conditioning was only used for podium tower blocks in the city centre, while the majority of the other spaces were designed to minimize discomfort through passive design strategies creating a heterogeneous thermoscape. The post-independent reconfiguration of thermal governance in Singapore also entailed major changes in the urban metabolism of the city-state, the most significant of which is the expansion in electricity generation capacity, which depended on fossil fuel sources. Singapore's status as a petrochemical hub, which once has the world's third largest refining capacity for crude oil, certainly enabled this expansion, especially during the 1970s oil crisis. On this note of fossil fuel and urban metabolism, let us move to our second case. In February 1982, the Doha Sheraton Hotel and conference center designed by American architecture firm William L. Pereira Associate was officially opened by the Emir of Qatar, Sheikh Khalifa bin Hamad Al Thani, on the 10th anniversary of his reign. Cited on the prominent location on the new district of Doha, the 150 million US dollars complex was, in the words of its architect, intended as, quote, oh, a hotel of world prestige, an institution for the country's frequent occasion of celebration, and a centre for Qatar's participation in world's affair. End quote. Completed at the end of the oil boom in petroleum exporting countries in the 1970s to 1980s, which, the, which in the West was known as the oil crisis initiated by the 1973 OPEC embargo, the complex could be seen as exemplifying the urban environmental and metabolic reconfiguration of Doha enabled by the oil boom. The location of the complex reflected its significance. Sited on the strategic plot of land at the northern end of the Corniche, 
with scarcely any other buildings around, the Doha Sheraton enjoys sweeping panoramic view. It was also designed by Pereira as a quote, sculptured monument with a strong dramatic profile that dominates the skyline, end quote. Today, the Corniche served as Doha's main scenic and ceremonial space. It first appeared as an important urban element in the second master plan of Doha, prepared in 1975 by the same firm, William Pereira Associates. The master plan was commissioned by the Qatar state primarily to lay out the new district, a large area reclaimed from the salt marshes and tidal flats to the northeast of the old Doha. In Polaris' master plan, the Corniche was envisioned as an urban spine along the waterfront that connects the new and old urban district in Doha together, while also restructuring the urban growth pattern of the city. To augment this new urban pattern that reoriented the city to the Doha Bay, Palera planned a few focal points along the Corniche to clearly mark the start, the midpoint, and the end point to give it what he called a visual unity. The Doha Sheraton complex marks the end of this urban spine, as you can see on the screen. Within the perimeter forms of the complex, there is a large 13-storey atrium. The atrium had been compared to the central courtyard of a traditional house in the region by the architect. He saw both as inward-looking central spaces where rooms were arranged around. Both typologies also purportedly offer environmental shelter from the sun, wind and dust of the desert. However, compared to the traditional house, the complex had entirely different construction material, construction methods and environmental technologies. While the traditional house had, had thick envelopes built from locally and regionally sourced materials such as limestone, mud and gravels for the wall, and mangrove wood beams, bamboo mat, woven reed and mud for the roof, the Doha Sheraton was built of modern materials like steel and reinforced concrete that were sourced from a geographically much larger and much more distributed network. For example, the structure was a steel frame manufactured in Japan by Kawada Industry, shaped to Doha and erected by a team of Japanese workers. Wrapping around the steel frame were precast concrete parts fabricated in the new state-of-art plant in Qatar, established especially for the construction of its complex. The, cab the cabinetry was fabricated in Korea and, and imported by the general contractor Hyundai Engineering and Construction. Other materials and equipment came from England, United States and Germany. All these were built and exemplified by the team of construction workers from South Asia. In terms of environmental technology, the traditional houses depended on their building materials to provide good thermal insulation from the hot climate the presence of liwan or veranda for sun shading, and the incorporation of bedju, which refer to both wind towers or air vents that channel air and facilitated ventilation to cool the interior. The environmental technologies at Doha Sheraton were fundamentally different. Although the atrium was analogized to a traditional courtyard, it relied on one of the largest and most sophisticated air conditioning installations in the Middle East to provide chill, dehumidified air. Like any air conditioning system, the one at the complex operated on the principle of keeping the interior hermetically sealed from the exterior. A 1980s brochure of the hotel described the atrium as a quote, luxurious, climatically controlled oasis of pools and large trees, unquote. A contemporary commentator noted that the word oasis was the most frequently used word to describe the planted atriums of new hotels in the Gulf Corporation Council or GCC countries. Other examples included Sharjah Internet, Intercontinental Hotel, designed by the Architects Collaborative, and Dubai Sheraton, designed by Radar Mileto Associates. Although almost, almost never discussed in contemporary sources, the amount of electricity needed to mechanically cool such large spaces in the hot climate of the region must have been enormous. One of the main but unwritten factors enabling the construction of complexes of this typology in the Gulf was the vast quantity of cheap electricity in the region. Though grander than most other buildings in Doha, the changes in construction material, methods and environmental technologies witnessed in Doha Sheraton also reflected, albeit at a much larger scale and greater intensity, broader built environmental changes in the city. The use of thin thermally conductive concrete and glass envelope in place of traditional well-insulated thick walls and roofs were already seen in the modern buildings widely erected during the 1970s urban expansion of the city. 
the replacement of passive cooling features with air conditioning to keep the inhabitants comfortable was also already a widespread phenomenon by the 1970s, together with automobile dependency created by the new road systems that included the Cornish these processes of urbanization and architectural production were made possible by heavily state-subsidized energy services. Like its GCC's neighbor, Qatar is a distributive state. Unlike a traditional state that extracts revenue from its population through taxation, a distributive state expands revenue, in this case the revenue from oil or oil rent, that went directly to the state, or more accurately, the family state. Urbanization through land acquisition and housing subsidies and social welfare that included free education, free healthcare and well-remunerated employment for its population were two of the main ways that the state distributes oil wealth to gain political support and quiescence. In addition, the state also provided heavily subsidized electricity and water which were enabled by the abundant oil and gas that the territory produced. This official beneficence contributed to the steep rise in electricity consumption which could also be partly accounted for by the widespread and excessive use of air conditioning. Not only was the use of mechanical cooling widespread, the thermostat was often set very low. The enormous climate, the enormous climate control atrium in Doha Sheraton exemplifies such a form of state-sponsored thermal entitlement. As with the earlier case of Singapore, the notion of thermal privilege in the post-independent aftermath of colonialism in Doha was also inextricably linked to the history of colonial environmental imaginary and energetics. In Doha case, its different political dynamics historically contributed to a distinct configuration of thermal privilege and violence. Like the tropics, the desert environment of the Middle East and North African region was historically represented as a strange and defective one in order to justify colonial environmental interventions and legitimize colonial rule. Scholars like Diana Harris, sorry, Diana Davis have shown that the hegemonic imaginary of the region's purportedly errant aridity shaped colonial and post-colonial policies and practices in agriculture, afforestation, hydraulic infrastructure, and many other fields. While such attention has been paid to the colonial environmental imaginary on the desert's aridity, there appear to be much less research done on the imaginary on the desert heat and how that help to remake the physical world and its atmosphere. Historian Toby Jones noted that one of the major sources of political authority and legitimacy of the regime in the Gulf state stemmed from their ability to alter the old environmental imaginary of desert by modifying the hot and arid landscape into one that is cool and fertile so as to provide their population physical relief from the perils of desert life. He argued that the remaking of nature was a form of statecraft in which power over the environment was also power over the population, to the extent that there emerged a kind of environmental subjectivity. While Jones' focus was on water and hydraulic technology, his argument could well be extended to heat and thermal technologies, as anthropologist Gotcha Guna did with her work on the region. In our discussion of the climatically controlled oasis of Doha Sheraton earlier, we saw the hotel atrium as an, as an expression of thermal entitlement and even privilege. Thermal privilege functions through the provision of luxury and access way beyond basic biological needs. It's about the returning of bodily thermoception to express affluence and perhaps even influence. In the Middle East, the most conspicuous consumers of mechanical cooling in the early years were the royal family. As a carrier corporation executive wrote in an internal memo in 1959, I quote, We have served many kings. I can recall King Farouk of Egypt, King Faisal of Iraq, King Ibn Saud of Saudi Arabia, King Saud son of King Ibn Saud, King Haile Selassie, King Hussein of Jordan, and many other rulers, queens, princes, and princesses, end quote. The comments about royal family, including the two generations of the House of Saud and air conditioning, was made after King Saud asked Carrier to install one of the world's largest air conditioning system for a new city, built specially to house his extended royal family of 15,000 members. This district cooling system supplied chill water to 134 buildings in 19 miles of pipes from seven centrifugal chillers. <coughs> 
King Saud's private city was preceded and succeeded by a number of other large air conditioning installations in Saudi Arabia. Such a form of thermal privilege as expressed through excessively large air conditioning capacity could also be clearly seen in the other Gulf states, including Qatar. Sorry about that. Um, a few more slides to go, so hopefully this will be the last one. Earlier, we discussed the influence of thermodynamics and energetics on the governance of work through the regulation of laboring bodies and their work environment. To avert entropy that was manifested as human fatigue, experts in the science of work tested and recommended ergonomics improvement to workplaces. Among the recommendations were those regulating the thermal environment so as to protect workers from exposure to extreme heat. While such recommendations were taken up by some Europeans and North American states, they were ignored elsewhere. As historian Om Barak argued, other epistemologies were in operation and exceptions were made to European norms as, quote, the empire created a constitutive outside of thermodynamics, unquote. Barak's argument was based on his study of the strokers working in the engine rooms of steamship traversing the Red Sea ports during the 19th century, racial physiology that, linger, that linked Darker skin colors to higher biological heat tolerance was used to justify the exposure of Somalis and Adenic stokers to intense heat and their suffering from frequent heat injuries in the underbellies of these ships. Such a disparity in the thermal exposure between different workers rationalized on the premise of essentialized racial difference was later also seen in the early oil towns in the Gulf region, in places such as Durham in Saudi Arabia, Awali in Bahrain, and Ahmadi in Kuwait, while executives lived in large air-conditioned houses and were provided air-conditioned amenities. Mechanical cooling was also supplemented by the shade of outdoor greenery in the gardens and parks of these oil towns. While the, while the white expatriates enjoy such thermal privileges, other residents of oil towns were less fortunate. Some might even be subjected to what Staroselsky called thermal violence through the exposure to high temperature and heat stress. Influenced by the segregated planning norms of British colonialism and the Jim Crow system of the American South, these oil towns were organized in a hierarchical manner that divided the workers into enclaves according to various social and racial logic. For example, in Durham oil town operated by Aramco, Saudi and other Arab unskilled workers were housed in Barasti or forest huts with thatched palm from roofs that had no running water and electricity until the late 1940s, while white American managers lived in air-conditioned California-style ranches with access to swimming pools. This race-based system of thermal privilege and violence, which was first established in the late 19th century, later became entrenched in the early oil towns of the 1950s, was transformed in the subsequent decades as the oil companies in the Gulf states were nationalized. As the white expatriates departed, the national took on their positions and entitlements. The Arab unskilled workers at the lower rung were also replaced by migrant workers from South Asia and elsewhere. The early oil town could arguably be seen as models that influenced the broader patterns of urbanization in the Gulf. The hierarchical and segregated planning of these oil towns were reproduced in the enclavic Gulf cities, just as the colonial racial ideas behind the oil towns were echoed in what Ahmad, Ahmad Khan calls the ethnocracy of Gulf states, which was governed by a ruling elite. A ruling ethnic group, sorry, a ruling ethnic group that enable the domination of the Gulf Arab nationals. These citizens, who were a minority in the wealthy GCC states, enjoy exclusive entitlements. Social, cultural, and spatial environmental distinctions were carefully configured through architecture and urban planning to differentiate them from the migrants. Thermal power, as articulated through thermal privilege and violence was part of this broader pattern of distinction and exploitation that we might discern from the recent World Cup controversies. As a way, 
I think this is fine since that's the last slide. Um, as, as a way to conclude, I'd like to briefly discuss three points. Um, one, state and thermal governance. Two, thermal imperialism, environment and energetics. Three, architecture metabolism. By examining the thermal politics, by examining the thermal politics and history of air conditioning and the built environment in Singapore and Doha, this lecture challenged the underlying thermal objectivity in the current approaches to cooling at the time of the climate crisis. It foregrounds the role played by states, and in these two cases, the post-colonial bio and techno politics of thermal governance in, a, in, a, in developmental and oil rentier states. In this way, this lecture broadens the current scholarship on air conditioning that tends to focus on the role played by private corporation and the influence of the market economy, especially to that in the West. In highlighting the involvement of colonial and post-colonial states in air conditioning projects, this lecture also shows the lingering influence of thermal imperialism. Thermal imperialism operates in at least two ways. Firstly, through the manner colonial environmental imaginaries of the tropics and the desert influence state actors and the way they reordered the built environment. Secondly, through the manner colonial energetic shape of disciplining of bodies control of metabolism and regulation of work and work environments to further development. In other words, thermal imperialism informs our ideas of thermal rights, privilege and violence and the exercise of thermal power in the global south. Finally, this lecture attempts to situate architecture in relation to thermal governance and thermal imperialism by seeing it as a metabolic vehicle, directing or diverting, catalyzing or inhibiting thermal energy flows within urban metabolism. In this way, a building or an infrastructure becomes a transcalar and transtemporal entity involved in thermal exchanges and resource flow, connecting sites in Asia to the planetary and the anthropocenic. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chatwi, for this excellent lecture. Um, my name is Kim Förster, and I was asked to give a response in 10 minutes or so. And due to the time, um, I, I prepared three points uh, according to the three points of your conclusion. Um, but maybe um, I uh, stick to two first, and um, just to have time for the discussion. Um, also, I don't know whether there's comments from the online audience, so please help me out later on uh, with this. But um, yeah, I'm um, very curious um, to, to look into those uh, terminological um, developments that you make, um, because I think this is the um, great contribution uh, with this paper somehow uh, with regard to thermal governance. Um, but then also um, the environmental narrative that you develop um, through um, comparing those uh, two examples um, and maybe we discuss the architectural part like all together. Um, so um, my first response concerns um, your work as, as not only an architectural historian, but with regard to, to this terminological work, your political analysis even um, somehow. And um, also in all those dialogues that you uh, laid out and which I think is, is important um, to, to entertain somehow and central to your lecture is this framing that you uh, started from um, the current situation somehow for global heating uh, with an uncertain outcome. Um, and in uh, contrast, cooling um, as a human right, which I think is, is very powerful. Um, and those two cases uh, contribute to it, especially um, in, in the tropics, being located in the tropics. And um, um, I think those storylines of climatization um, are essential there to, to highlight those. So I'm, I'm summarizing a bit, but I'm commenting, but I'm also pro presenting two, two questions. Um, since you historicize and politicize uh, those approaches to cooling um, um, as examples of uh, thermal governance. And I, I think Michel Foucault's notion of governance uh, somehow of uh, governing um, a population uh, already occupied your work um, even with this genealogy of tropical architecture. So it's a continuation, in a way, uh, what you've been doing. And um, 
um, the two cases um, you study um, that uh, combine uh, bio and technopolitics uh, somehow. Singapore since independence and Doha with uh, oil boom informed by approaches then of the history of science and technology, media studies, history, uh, anthropology allowed you, I think, to enter um, um, this role of the state and the state enterprises um, in the creation of comfort, um, which you also discuss as social construct um, at the in intersection of statecraft, of climate control, of productivity. And uh, what was new for me here uh, was how you discussed this uh, reconfiguration of thermal governance in terms of district cooling. And um, I wonder um, how you would, like yourself, um, uh, put this back to the table because it's, I think, innovative work um, that, that you've been doing. Um, using both the example of, of Singapore um, with this like uh, three-phase expansion uh, somehow uh, with regard to British colonial era um, uh, buildings adapted for climate control um, and then those new podium tower blocks. Uh, and then maybe this is also um, like to take some lessons from. Um, and um, I think it is essential to um, also acknowledge um, the American origin. William Carrier uh, plays a role um, for, for your research um, as the founder of um, the International Carrier Corporation um, with regard to this national development of, of Singapore. And Doha, on the other hand, I think is, is a powerful uh, parallel case that you develop um, where um, the, the local Sheraton um, also um, an American design um, with its glass roof atrium um, somehow um, that you discussed um, quite beautifully is exemplary for the strict separation um, that we are facing um, somehow of inside and outside. Um, and um, also the, the urban um, um, planning and reorganization that goes with it uh, somehow. And um, I think what is uh, important is to, to know that you discuss both cases with regard uh, to um, oil industries and oil businesses um, as the uh, precondition, uh, but also this complication um, of both cases. And um, what I find intriguing is um, somehow that your stories are not just about cooling um, and air conditioning, but much more. Um, so it's not only about uh, this mechanical type, uh, but rather uh, somehow you have this uh, broader processes of, of urbanization um, happening, of modernization of state, also of architecture, I think, that is um, um, independence on oil. Um, and I think this is a relevant move that you, you make um, somehow. And uh, you introduce this concept of fossil developmentalism uh, by Elizabeth uh, Shatterjee um, as a counter term to Timothy Mitchell's fossil capitalism. Um, and I think this this uh, kind of uh, global ecology is, is maybe something to look at again. And um, significant here is your um, uh, highlighting of Singapore's reputation as Houston of Asia. Um, which is a parallel story of that of OPEC, I think. Um, so um, one of the questions that I have with regard to, to this, this um, like uh, epistemological work that you're doing is to what extent does this concept of thermal governance enable you to write a rather nuanced uh, and more complex his, his history, um, both of the two sides, but also of cooling in general. Um, and uh, what analytical but also critical potential um, does the concept have for, for you, if you have to put it in uh, in a nutshell uh, somehow? What is your position then uh, to those developments um, of the state and of architecture um, somehow that you have described so, so beautifully here, um, which um, are also always reversible? Um, so this is my first comment or response. Um, and the second um, is a bit broader um, somehow with regard to, to what you termed thermal imperialism and, and environment. And um, um, yeah, relates to, to this very own voice that you've developed uh, over the last years with this research with regard to Singapore and Doha um, somehow in um, 
addition to the energy and environmental perspective, um, which we add to the literature, uh, which I'm very um, um, yeah, in favor of and, and um, also would like to, to highlight as your main achievement uh, somehow. Um, and uh, this is, goes along different scales, and you highlighted uh, it's architectural and urban at the same time, but the territory of the state comes in, and then there's this interplay of the globe and the, the planetary um, that you ended with. Um, so somehow, um, we've known each other for a couple of years, for five years, and have been working in this project that Rick's mentioned, um, Architecture and for the Environment um, at the Canadian Center for Architecture, um, uh, which aimed to, to rewrite architectural history, and your contribution was essential to it, uh, somehow through notions of the environment, and um, also in a global perspective. And I think this is where um, you enter into, into the dialogue, and um, this group project you might want to look it up um, somehow is now published in chapters, open access via library stack, um, and um, ranges from coal um, also to bring it back to London um, as a thing, as an object being traded um, in the coal exchange and financing somehow urban developments in London um, to the Amazon as um, um, a region, a landscape, um, to um, um, be demanded heritage status for. And this was Paulo Tavares' um, project who uh, just won a golden line with it. And I think your project somehow was um, as much entering a global um, South and Asian voice to, to the table. Um, and uh, this paper was a further development that I value highly um, somehow with regard to is exactly uh, thermal governance. Um, but also um, thermal violence um, as, as a term. And um, so, yeah, I um, would be curious somehow um, to, to what extent those two cases, both of Singapore and Doha, that you put next to each other, as in your previous iteration, here now take on a different life for you. Um, because I, I think they do. Um, and how you relate them. So what is this comparison actually doing in looking at um, somehow cooling um, again? Um, with regard to exactly this history that you write, be critical, um, but also we discussed a lot to what extent do those histories become operative. Um, so what are the notions of architecture and cooling that go along with it, and um, um, also linking climate history and, and, and human history uh, differently. And um, yeah, um, so maybe you can uh, reflect about um, somehow this juxtaposition that you offer here again, and uh, how you thought about it differently within your work and uh, to whatever. Um, also um, allow us to, to see how you think with both cases um, together, but also differently. First of all, thank you for that. Um, fascinating lecture and thank you for the response. Um, could I ask you first to um, to reply to um, Kim's, uh, Kim's maybe one, maybe two points? Um, thanks so much, Kim, um, for, for the questions. Um, I think your two questions, the first one is about perhaps um, it's about what analytical utility or what do I gain by deploying the concept of thermal governance? Why do I use it? Yeah. So um, one reason for using thermal governance is to not to look at um, air conditioning in isolation, not to look at cooling for comfort in isolation versus cooling for other purposes. For example, during heat wave whereby it's more than comfort, it's more a matter of life and death. So I, I, I thought I wanted to understand a whole spectrum of cooling um, and cooling for different purposes from situation of what we call normality in terms of um, comfort and also extreme cases in terms of life saving and it becomes a right and no longer kind of a luxury. I thought um, what is interesting in this moment is that the, the boundary between where essential or necessity end and, um, and, 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 and uh, luxury begins is not no longer so clear cut because the whole range of um, 
um, rising temperature, heat waves, and things like that. So I, 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 I began looking at um, various standards, not just thermal comfort standard, but also um, um, heat action plans, and also about um, um, the kind of uh, industrial health and standards for what constitute uh, unbearable um, thermal distress in work environment. And then um, I thought, maybe it will be interesting, or at least that is the ambition to pull these different strands together under one spectrum and using thermal governance to really analyze that. So thermal governance just referring to any forms of thermal intervention in through the spectrum and not just um, to look at comfort versus um, something else, for example. And of course, um, governance as a word um, also I think um, Maybe I alluded to this in my talk. Um, foreground the role that is played by state, state intervention, and you briefly mentioned, uh, I think, uh, Elizabeth Chatterjee, which was subsequently dropped from my lecture script. But uh, Elizabeth Chatterjee developed this idea of fossil developmentalism versus and, um, Andrew Mom, and, Andrew Mom's notion of fossil capital. So fossil capital is that narrative about how private capital was essential in this whole process of carbon law in during um, the Industrial Revolution. But Elizabeth Chatterjee argued that it's not private capital that play an important role in Asia. I think she did two cases um, in India, in post-independent India, and also in Maoist China, I believe. And she argued that the developmental state, the de um, development and the state was the key player in terms of um, driving the kind of a carbon lock-in and also the escalation in carbon emission. So I think there are two parts to that. One, thinking about the spectrum, using the word thermal, and the other part, thinking about the state and the politics in relation to the state um, through the word governance. So hopefully that answers your first question. Second question, um, I came to look at these two cases in a rather um, unplanned manner. I happen to, I'm from Singapore, so I'm interested in Singapore, and subsequently, um, through working with a few colleagues, we got a research grant from the Qatar government, and we end up working in Qatar. So, and then, and then that that's how these two cases came together. For as you probably know through the project, for the longest time, I've been struggling thinking about how do I discuss these two ex these two cases together. Um, I, I think the easy way to talk about them together is that both are in some ways addicted to air conditioning. So Singapore is an air conditioned nation. Qatar is a place that you know air conditioning is also very prevalent and is, is available everywhere. So I thought that that is perhaps one way to think about it. And then later I I, I, I thought about it in other ways, especially during the pandemic, where during the pandemic and during the last um, World Cup, the last FIFA World Cup, um, there were media report about mistreatment of migrant workers and how migrant workers were die, dying from um, heat injuries and heat illnesses. So that's a kind of a thermal violence that led me to think about Qatar. And in Singapore, there was a similar thing, maybe less reported by international media, but, um, but um, there are also forms of violence that were highlighted during the pandemic. So that, and, and I became interested in that concept. And of course, Nico Saraselsky's book was published in 2021 in the midst of the pandemic as well. And she given, I mean, from that book, I've acquired a kind of, a, hopefully a kind of conceptual toolkit to talk about things like that. Yeah. And, and you probably read that. She, she wrote about um, thermal violence in a journal article first, and subsequently she developed it for her book, uh, Media Hot and Cold. And that was a really powerful book. It's this this concept just to, to, to chime in um, that uh, Nikola Stasiewski uh, develops with regard to the sweat box as a carceral instrument where the body becomes the medium to exercise heat uh, on human bodies and um, what I find powerful is that you apply to architecture both historically uh, with regard to the early oil cities up in the Gulf region somehow where it's um, somehow the division, uh, the unevenness of air conditioning uh, in the urban realm, um, but also you, you apply through the present situation. And, uh, yeah, um, then not the same, but somehow you see a continuation, I guess, um, or you su suggest one, and uh, maybe you, you want to comment on, on, on this continuation. The, the continuation part, like, uh, as I said earlier, this is a work in progress. So um, because of the pandemic, I've not been able to 
carry out a uh, few work um, in in the Gulf region. So I plan to plan to go there. Um, hopefully in the in the next half a year or a year, and and get a deeper understanding of that. Um, so I don't really know what happens there besides what I'm reading from the media report. So I probably need to know a bit more before making the kind of um, assertion about the more violence over there. Yeah. Okay. Let's open it up to questions from the audience. Mark? Um, okay, um, thanks a lot for that. Um, it's a, a typical uh, production of great research and you know some re really great thinking. Uh, and I too like the way in which you mobilize certain terms um, like th thermal violence and uh, thermal privilege. Um, I had really, I, I guess, two question comments about two terms. Um, I was also um, exercised by the term uh, governance, um, so I'd like to hear more about that because I'm not sure whether thermal governance, in the way you're using it here, is any different from a term like thermal, thermal management. Um, and given that you make lots of references to what we could call government, sorry, governments in the formal sense, Indian governments, governments around the world, dynastic governments like Singapore, um, then, um, you know, aren't, where, where is the politics here? Because I'm not convinced it belongs in the term governance. Um, so that's one comment, and it's, uh, you know, you'd expect that from me. Um, the other is um, about uh, universalism, which appears at the beginning of the talk, mm. but then kind of disappears, and I wondered what happened, happened to it. Mm. The talk starts out by being a kind of critique of universalism, mm. and I think in, what's implied then is that localism or culturalism, mm. let's say, Mm. is the position from which that critique is being mm. exercised. Um, but I'm not quite sure if that w is what really happens in the rest of the talk. Mm. I mean, one could make a case for a universalist appreciation of culturalist or localist forms of temperature management, thermal management. Mm. And I think you're doing that, but I think that could be called universalism. Mm. Uh, sorry, uh, I don't know if you want to answer. I have a question that's quite similar, so. so yeah, okay. <laughs> Maybe do, we do all three and then you want sure, to. Sure, why not? Do you want to go on <laughs> um, Thanks so much for this really great talk, and I found your research very useful for my own, so thank you very much. Um, to Mark's point about governance, I've been thinking about the, the work of maintenance in your talk. Um, you're describing two very different kinds of hot environments. One's very hot and humid, one's hot and arid. It makes me think about, to bring it back to the air conditioning machine itself, how does that governance play out perhaps in the maintenance of those machines? Do, is there some way to kind of extract some of these larger political trajectories that you are pointing to in the talk through the manual labor of working through breakdown? Or like, what are some of the ways in which these climates are perhaps resisting this machine or reacting to this machine? And are there some ways to think through that question of government governance through maintenance? Perhaps was you know like a follow up question um, to that. Uh, and then, so how are questions about heat and comfort and hot and humid and arid all kind of playing out through this um, this imposition of of, of uh, air conditioning? Mm. I think my question is closer to what Mark was talking about in terms of governance and mm -hmm. thinking about government versus management in some sense because, um, well, I think I'm quite interested in the politics of um, what you describe also as, uh, in some sense, politics of the global south, but is it 
in, uh, when you start thinking about it in terms of thermal privilege mm -hmm. and thinking of the developmental state really using air conditioning as a, in some sense, also a post-colonial developmental move against thermal imperialism, but also what are the regimes of power that are then uh, thermal power, I suppose, uh, exposed when you're thinking about sort of migrant labor, but also the place of some something like Singapore and Doha in the global south, right? Like I think, yeah. so I'm quite interested in that sort of space between sort of governance, mm -hmm. but also a, a broader um, politics, a mm -hmm. broader geopolitics, mm -hmm. um, especially in relationship to the fact that cooling produces warming somewhere else, right? Mm -hmm. So so how that how that works, I think, is something I'm curious about. And I think more generally as well, I was wondering if you might speak to um, what it means to cool in a, in a sort of, uh, in the Anthropocene, for the lack of a better, you know, in a, in a warming world, <laughs> let's just say. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> you take your time. <laughs> I, I, I think these are great questions. Um, I, um, <laughs> I, I think it's a good question to 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 ask in terms of governance uh, versus management. Management seems much more managerial, I guess, much more about um, standards and norms and and maybe the under. The, the kind of politics might be underplayed, as Shia, I think you, you, you hinted at. Um, air conditioning, as we know, is a, I think it's a selfish technology. It cools the inside, but warms the outside. So heat exchange means that um, you know, only certain spaces are cool, while other spaces might be heated up. So it's never, it's never something that cools everywhere and equally for everyone. So I think that there is a kind of um, if you like a kind of um, techno politics that's built into the technology in itself, yeah. Um, Mark, I'm not sure when when does I mean I'm not sure what are what what are the things that clearly distinguish between um, management and governance because from some. From some perspective, one could argue that um, governance is also a form of management in the Foucauldian sense. It's about certain arrangement of things, certain distribution of resources. So there is a, 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 a sense of you know the managerial aspect of um, allocating of resources and, and and arrangement of certain things. Don't you think? So I'm, I'm not sure if that, <laughs> in a way then begin to approximate um, governance in the management sense. Yeah. But that might not be adequate in that, um, you know, Shreya, your question about um, the uneven politics. And also, I think, I think the, 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 the most obvious thing is that Singapore and Qatar are probably not the kind of places you straight away associate with the global south. Uh, you think of them as exception, and I've been asked this by Kim and 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 others uh, when when they were editing the volume, yeah. But I I sort of try to work around this. I'm not sure whether it's convincing by saying that um, both places are rather heterogeneous. Both places um, foreground the kind of um, an unevenness that you see in many other places as well. So parts of it, especially when it comes to the migrant workers' dormitory, for example, you would. The, the, the sense of um, kind of a inequity would be really very much foregrounded. And there's also a sense that the middle class kind of uh, air-conditioned lifestyle is not just unique to, to Singapore and, and, and Qatar, but it's also something that you see in many other parts of the global south as well. So I guess it's a, a question of degree of differences, and, and this is something that I try to work around with, thinking about degree of differences in, in, in that sense. Yeah. And um, regarding the questions of maintenance, I think it's an important one. Um, I think a few things are being maintained here. Firstly, the use of air conditioning to maintain a certain manner of working, to enable continuous working, regardless of you know, diurnal and seasonal fluctuation, so that you can keep working at your desk and you can be incredibly efficient. Yeah. So that, that is a kind of a maintenance of a certain 
labor regime or certain work pattern. But of course, air conditioning itself requires maintenance. And of course, air conditioning is also used to not just maintain human, but sometimes to maintain things. In, in a humid climate, things break down easily, you know, uh, um, because it's so moist, you know, uh, um, bacteria or whatever grow easily. So refrigeration and the cold chain is essentially about um, preventing things from becoming obsolete very fast to extend the shelf life of things. Air conditioning has that dimension too. Um, in, in a slightly different sense, the most obvious case would be in museums and in libraries whereby air conditioning is always installed to preserve the artifacts as much as to preserve human beings within, right? Yeah. Is that what you're working on? Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so I guess that is the other kind of um, using air conditioning to maintain people, work patterns and things and existing arrangement of people and things. So that is that. But air conditioning um, requires its own form of maintenance, its own, own form of um, keeping the machines running. And, and, and that is the part probably I've not been paying enough attention to um, and I've not uh, really um, think about it that much. Yeah, with regard to breakdown and resistance, I have thought about it minimally, to be honest. I've not really think about breakdown and resistance because things don't break down that much in Singapore, I guess. <laughs> so there are not, not many sufficient occasions for me to think about that. There are crisis moments, as with everywhere, the pandemic is one of those, but in general, there, were, there are not that many moments. And back to uh, Mark, your second question about universalism, I probably need to examine it a bit more. I, 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 I totally understand what you mean by how the talk is really not about localism or a form of any form of culturalism and a kind of a local culture or, or thermal culture of uh, keeping cool at all. So that, that part is not there other than maybe the brief mention of um, vernacular architecture. So I, I'm, I'm with you on that. So probably I should look at my use of universalism because it might not be that central, but I was thinking universalism more in the techno-scientific sense of um, you know, international comfort standard that is applied in a, in, in a rather in, in, in a uniform manner throughout different geographies. So I'm thinking more in terms of that and, and how um, in thinking about cooling as a uh, as a techno scientific problem, there is always the sense of uh, resorting to standards, to to norms, to things to adhere to, and and in terms of uh, maintaining that and and ignoring the the the, the different place based culture or for the for the lack of a better phrase. Yeah, but but you are right that my talk itself hardly um, covered that aspect. Yeah. Perhaps to quickly follow up on that, um, I'm curious, sort of, if you talk about universalism in terms of comfort has has the notion of comfort of human comfort changed over time and or is it different in different places from sort of say like the british research on like tropical architecture in the 50s 60s to what it is now sort of has it changed in a warming world um or is it different in doha than it is in singapore um there are different comfort standards around based on different um, methodologies and they have arrived at different standards and norms. What's interesting is that um, um, globally the two dominant comfort standards is the lab-based experiment standard derived from that and then the field-based kind of standard. And the difference between the two is that the field-based standard, in fact, suggests that um, comfort standard depends a lot more on social cultural practices and then and, and it has got a much um, wider range of comfort rather than a very narrow prescribed range for the lab-based studies. So I think I think that there, there are research done in that aspect and, and we can say that um, culture and social practices really inform comfort and a person who has written extensively on this is a sociologist by the name of Elizabeth Schof. Um, she wrote a book called Comfort, Cleanliness and Convenience and, and I think um, two or three chapters really look at the evolution of this kind of comfort standard and the problem with comfort standards like that rather than um, understanding comfort as a set of attributes. She argued that comfort should be understood as a set of practices. Mm. So practices are always um, social, culturally specific. Yeah, so, so I thought that that, that is really, I think, a 
in that sense, I think this part of the scholarship will answer the question that you have really quite well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. If I've got anything to say, it's really derivative from what um, Elizabeth mm -hmm. Shelf has done. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think we have time for maybe one or two questions. Uh, th thanks so much for the fascinating talk. Um, I had a, a question and then a speculation following on from it. Um, I was wondering if you see um, a shift, or maybe it's a kind of parallelism bet between um, air conditioning delivered um, by these small commodities, these boxes, you know, that can be packaged and sold to households, um, and on the other hand, large systems. Um, I, I recall kind of Rainer Bannum's um, architecture of the well-tempered environment, and in there, there's the kind of switch the other way around from uh, large kind of systems akin to district cooling and hospitals and so on to, to the packaging and commodification of this um, technology. And are, are we undergoing a, a shift in the reverse direction and what might be the reasons for that? And that brings in the state and so on and necessitates state planning and intervention on such a large scale. Um, I guess my speculation following on from that is it, it kind of relates to some of the things Shreya was saying about... Um, I guess I think of it in terms of kind of risk, you know, spatialization of risk between zones, between safe zones and zones that are abandoned or left to uh, burn, made to burn. Um, and I, I found there was something kind of sublime and almost terrifying in the, in the vision, that, in the kind of linkage that you, you, you described so well between um, oil and, and cooling um, and, and thermal violence. And, and, and one of the you know the things that can't be avoided is 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 war and contemporary imperialism. You know, and and oil's role in that. And it seems to me that one of the bizarre things about the, the amount of international capital pouring into places like uh, Neom, um, and these new cities in the Gulf, is is the kind of wreckage and destruction across the rest of the region driven by contemporary imperialist wars and the creation of these safe zones supposedly safe zones and the image around that. And I wonder what role cooling and the creation of these very controlled environments plays in that. Thank you. Um, yeah, um, I, I think it was Gil Cooper, um, one of the first historians to write about the history of the air conditioning industry in, in the United States. Um, she she made a distinction between air conditioning as an appliance, like the package unit that you talk about, you could buy one and you install it at home, um, and then versus um, air conditioning as an installation, there is something that is highly customized for a building and is typically a central air conditioning system. So she make a distinction between that. Um, I wrote something about that in a book that Mark co-edited, <laughs> looking at um, the installation of a particular kind of package unit in, in um, Singapore's public housing and how the public housing was subsequently designed to accommodate that. So I look at uh, the, the Japanese um, led kind of invention of a split unit system that is very common in Asia. And, and now I think the other parts of the world whereby you have a one external compressor and then it hasn't got any air duct. What it, what it does is it links um, the kind of uh, the chillen um, to um, various air handling units within the interior. So I wrote a bit about that history of that domestic air conditioning in the Singapore context. And, and, and talk about some of the differences in terms of how it interacts with the built environment and it allows for um, different kind of uh, changes of uh, thermal material culture. Against drawing from Elizabeth Shove's idea about how when the indoor temperature gets shifted from the regular tropics one to something that is 21 degrees Celsius at 50% humidity, a lot of things change. Yeah, the ambient temperature change, the way you sleep change, the design of furniture change. And I was talking about how, you know, in in, in many places like Singapore and many other middle class population in the tropics, now the duvet is part of the home furnishing, whereas before air conditioning you wouldn't really need the duvet, right, with tropical climate. Yeah, and there are other things as well. And also for a while, halogen light was the in thing in interior design because it gave a kind of warm glow. And that will only make sense if you cool the interior to really low temperature. So tiny little material cultural changes um, affecting the interior design and interior configuration. 
So, so that was something that I was very interested in. But when it comes to centralized cooling in office um, and in work environment, in large offices, then the degree of, um, of customization and the degree of individualization is, tends to be reduced. Uh, I'm not sure whether it's the case in, in, in UK, but in many places, for example, even when there's a thermostat, the thermostat frequently either doesn't work or sometimes it gets locked up because um, the building management system would really want to control um, the energy consumption and would like to control other things. So, so when it's designed as a system, it tends to be controlled by the so-called expert, the technicians, and, and then um, the inhabitants of the building would not have the same kind of level of um, intervention in changing the air conditioning system. So I think there are there's some kind of um, um, very practical everyday practices in terms of that. Um, and um, in terms of risk and spatialization, um, I can't really think of anything beyond um, you know, the idea of something that's centralized versus decentralized in terms of speculation. And also this kind of emerging trend whereby um, social economic inequality has manifested in itself in terms of the kind of spatial inequality as well. Now you have ecological enclave zones that are well protected from climate change, rising sea level and things like that. And there are people looking at the kind of a large, large scale encapsulation of interior spaces a little bit like what Peter Slaughter I talk about in terms of the kind of climatic islands, yeah. Um, we don't have much or any time, but I don't want to leave our online audiences um, out of this. So I'm going to very quickly read out two questions. They're quite different, but I'll read them out together and then maybe have a short answer. And also we'll uh, forward questions um, to uh, Jetwee, so if you want to send anything in um, online, feel free and um, or send us an email as well. Um, the, the first one is a, a practical question on how important do you think it is for the, uh, for the thermal regime of a heritage building to be preserved in governmental frameworks? For instance, preserving passive cooling in tropical shop houses or preserving air conditioning of large spaces in uh, conserved podium and slab buildings? And then uh, the second question is broader. Um, it's, uh, mm, with the frequency of extreme heat, we are now seeing thermal governance exercise more through climate change adaptation plans and strategies for extreme conditions. Climate change strategy can be, slightly, can be a slightly different space because it usually acts as an umbrella for other policies and it is more concerned with emer emergencies, short-term extreme heat events, for example. How do you view thermal governance within the broader scheme of climate change adaptation? So, <laughs> thanks, thanks. no easy task to <laughs> summarize, but. Uh, th thanks for the question. I think with regard to the first question, um, the current, I think, conservation guidelines tends to privilege the visual. So when you talk about authenticity, talking about um, preserving something in an intact manner. Um, my belief is that I'm not a conservation expert, but my belief is that it tends to privilege the visual sense. So it's about visual coherence, it's about visual authenticity. So quite common in, in, in Southeast Asia and Singapore and the region is that when an old colonial building is conserved, um, it tends to be air conditioned as well and um, the windows will be sealed with um, um, glass panels and then what they'll typically do is that sometimes they will push out the timber shutters um, as, if, as if there's a tim timber shutters there, but the timber shutters will be fixed in position. And behind that, there is a kind of a seal by the, a, a glass piece. So I saw that in a number of so-called boutique hotel based on conserved um, colonial um, bungalows and colonial villas. So that, that's what happened. I do think it's, it's useful to think about um, conserving um, the, the, the thermal aspect of buildings as well. Um, but maybe with some level of modification, um, and now there are hybrid technologies whereby you could you could use um, the combination of um, of some form of air cooling with the use of some form of fans as well, and introduce that into into the building rather than um, opting for the easy option to seal everything up and mechanically cool the interior space. So that's my response to that. The second question with regard to um, the question of um, heat action plan and how would, um, what, what is the kind of um, thermal governance or heat action plan um, in relation to also the, the question of um, time scale um, and the temporality of heat action plan. I, I really do not know enough 
on this, so I, I can't really comment. I'm still learning a lot about heat action plan and, and think, thinking about that in relation to um, thermal governance. But my sense is that most of the intervention or heat action plan come in the form of uh, one, a kind of a warning system so that the general public know that a heat wave is coming. Two, um, comes in forms of uh, hydration um, in terms of um, encouraging hydration and providing um, maybe um, um, improving the kind of uh, water infrastructure so that um, there might be more drinking points in, in, in certain um, societies. And third, less common, which is um, providing this kind of a cool refuge of um, a tiny um, air-conditioned spaces. I've seen this um, implemented in parts of North America and maybe in Japan. Yeah, but I, I really do not know enough about this. Yeah. But thanks for the question. Um, thank you so much. I think we need to leave it at that. Um, thank you to our speaker. Thank you to our respondent. Um, thank you to everyone joining online. And uh, for everyone here, uh, please join us um, for a drink and maybe some more questions. <laughs>